Day four, morning number three in the backcountry. We slept way up there by those trees. Super fun. And a uh, nice little hike in this morning. We got started around 9.15. And we're gonna cool off a little bit in the water. It's already baking. We're gonna get, we only have about five and a half miles today till the start of the Half Dome Trail. So shorter day for us. We're excited about that. Big day in the morning. Just finished our dunk in the Merced River. And there's kind of an interesting lesson here that I think applies to parenting and even applies to your view of God in many ways. Um, so yesterday we had breakfast at that Alpine Lake, Fogelzing Lake, and we started hiking. And we were only hiking for about seven or eight minutes and we just realized how hot we already were and how hot we were gonna get. And so we actually dropped our packs, turned back around, jumped in Fogelzing Lake and cooled off and then hiked back up to our packs and kept going for the day. Now, the interesting thing was I've done enough hiking where I more or less knew that we should have jumped in the lake to start the day before we even started hiking because I knew it was going to be that hot. But that lake was freezing cold and it was fairly uncomfortable um, starting your day dipping into a freezing cold lake. But it was even more uncomfortable to be hiking uh, in the heat without being wet. And so what was interesting is we actually needed to just we actually needed to discover and experience some of the discomfort that came with heat before we were willing to sign up for voluntarily the discomfort that came with the freezing cold lake. And so what's interesting is, you know, an expert or a guide could have said, uh, you're going to be uncomfortable later with the heat. So be uncomfortable now with this cold lake and the small amount of discomfort now will ease the greater amount of discomfort later. And, and he would have been right, just like a parent is often right, or uh, God is right about what we need and what we really want in our deepest sense. But we probably wouldn't have been convinced. And we actually needed to experience some of that discomfort before realizing, yeah, you know what, actually, I wanna go sign up for that other discomfort to alleviate some of this discomfort. So it's just kind of an interesting lesson about how uh, someone speaking the truth uh, even convincingly might not be enough. You might actually need to experience discomfort, pain, suffering, trials, tribulation before you recognize what's really best for you. And, and that's really profound uh, when you think of it in the context of God and how he allows some pain and suffering into our lives. Uh, and as you think of it as a parent, how you try and convince your child of something and they're not interested in taking your counsel and they gotta go suffer a little bit in the world before they realize, oh my goodness, mom and dad were right. So anyway, so uh, lesson learned this morning, even though it was uh, slightly less cold, we just jumped in the Merced River and cleaned up and got ready for a sunny, hot day. And uh, yeah, that's what wisdom looks like, I think. Knowing uh, what discomfort looks like and knowing how to alleviate it and um, knowing how to make good decisions even before you've suffered a little bit. So good morning, Merced. So one more thought on the topic of comfort and discomfort as my wife puts on this freezing cold shirt. <laughs> Um, I think that's one of the things that's really powerful about being out in nature, uh, especially for like a slightly extended period of time, is, is you realize that the world has been lying to you. The world kind of tells you you can have it all. You can have all the comforts, all the conveniences. There's no downside, there's no catch. And out here you realize that's just not true and you're being lied to. In other words, if you want comfort in an hour when it's sunny, you have to experience discomfort now by putting on a cold shirt. If you want the comfort of a big, fluffy mattress and pillow, you have to experience the discomfort of carrying it. And, and so you realize that there's these connections between all of these decisions and there's basically no freebies. Um, and, and maybe that's intuitive to a lot of people and people already know that, but we kind of need to be taught it repeatedly because the world is constantly telling us, you know, get this app, get this bank account and you'll have all your dreams come true. No catch, no downside. And so uh, nature is kind of like this calibrator that brings you back to reality a little bit. And that can be really useful. We came from over there, that V notch. We're about uh, five miles away from the base of Hefto. Gorgeous. Hey kiddos, do you see? You see that little guy? Daddy and I have just been sitting here resting a little bit and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, two of those came running up from behind us. Straight towards us. Straight towards us. We both like 
jumped up and a little nervous, like what were they up to? And then I just thought, well, what if they were watching us, like we watch animals and being really quiet and then they wanted to run up and scare us just to see what we would do. So we totally freaked out. They got us. Speak for yourself. <laughs> he jumped up too. What? You did. Don't film me. <laughs> Squirrels have been chasing each other like crazy. Incredible on trees. They they are so fast and they jump from tree to tree to outmaneuver each other. It's hilarious. This one's been he's been chasing the other one. He's been chasing Bill. Yeah, Michelle thinks they're saying Bill, 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 Bill. The other one's camouflaged in here, you can't see him. He's like still as can be. Grateful for some flat stuff? So grateful, yeah. Yeah. Bit of a butt kicker this morning. <laughs> so that's half dome right there, just the tip of it. It's sticking out. Obviously it's shrouded by a hill, but you see the edge. It's kind of cool. What do you think of this? Little taste of fall? It's beautiful. They are cute, aren't they? Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing how fast this scenery changes. All of a sudden you're like on this, you know. 12 inch wide trail you dare say overgrown though it's very pleasant to walk through it's not thorny or anything like that but just so thick we were just out on that exposed bald and dome and granite dome i guess is the word it's amazing and right through there a beautiful lake we're gonna get lunch i don't know if you can hear but michelle says the trees are clapping their hands <laughs> Another favorite of ours. I think these are sugar pines. I've actually never seen so many in one place before. Uh, in Sequoia, we've seen them uh, and Yosemite, but this is, you know, there's 20 or 30 all right here. And they're just, they're just enormous. Look at that. <laughs> we don't bring a sponge or anything like that while we backpack. Um, the pot does get a little bit funky. You can clean it with your finger and water, uh, but this also works really well where you basically get some um, grass or something and you kind of mix it around in there and then dump it out and give it a rinse. So I'll show you what it looks like when I'm done. That's what it looks like now. So after a bunch of scrubbing, all of these things have kind of broken up into little tiny bits. It kind of acts like a scrub brush and then the rinse. And there she is. <laughs> someone, didn't want, someone didn't want her foot in the picture. Yeah, got a lot of Luca tape on those feet. But um, yeah, you get this thing really clean if you're up on a bald and not anywhere near water. Um, so yeah, one less thing to bring, a scrubby brush. This is where we had lunch today. And this was probably my favorite spot that we've been to so far on the trip. I'll just show it to you. That's called uh, Brunel's, I think Brunel point and the texture on that dome is just really incredible and then uh, I don't know the name of that guy right there next to it but he's been like shaded all day or since we've been here we've been here about an hour but you just you just can't even like fathom this landscape and and basically if you look over there that little peak up there like we were beyond that i mean we're just like dots in the landscape it's, it's just incredible and the sky's been super beautiful mixed cloud and shade or sun yeah and then if you look closely you see just the tip of half dome over there uh, to the right of the tree just beyond that hill so we're going to be seeing him proper pretty soon and then you have this behind us. It's just everywhere you look. And it's, it's just so vast. It's really humbling, which I think maybe we all need a bit more of. And then the wind up here has been awesome. You might be able to hear it now. You could put, definitely put some climbing routes up in here, but the approach would be like 10 miles. I don't know that that many people would wanna do that. But the views would be good. A young male. 
looking right at us. <laughs> Look at that. Hi, buddy. We got four little horns. Or, I meant points, not horns. Four points on his antlers. I know the difference between horns and antlers, everybody. I promise. Interesting bushes here. They're, they're kind of like thorns, almost. But like really light-duty thorns. So they scratch up. But it's, it's almost pleasant. It's not pleasant. Well, <laughs> some of us think it's almost pleasant. It, it, I think I have one. We've, I haven't seen a single mosquito. But I must have got bit by something like a mosquito. Because I have one little itchy part of my left leg. And these, these scratchers are like... It's so pleasant. They're scratching that side. It's wonderful. Yeah, this terrain is not super nice. Because obviously there was a burnout. And then all this kind of stuff grows back when there's no canopy. I know this from the Kahuta Wilderness Rough Ridge. Michael Conyers, you remember our favorite, thanks to a big fire in 2016. Not the most fun terrain. Okay, a little commercial here for Cotopaxi. <laughs> um, when I was out west two months ago, I had, um, I didn't have a sun shirt. I didn't own one. I had something kind of like a sun shirt, but it was, uh, thicker. It's the orange one that I have from the North Face. Um, anyway, this I bought from Cotopexi. It's called a Sun Hoodie. I don't know what it's called. You have to look it up if you're that interested. But I compared it to a couple other ones at REI. It's very, very thin and extremely breathable. And what's interesting is, like I compared it to other comparable Sun Hoodies and, and they felt more like um, I don't know, more like a swim shirt or like a surfer shirt. I forget what they call those things, rash guards, um, where they like kind of sticks and clings to you. Anyway, my sit, my wife, my sister, my wife bought this same one, the girl version, and it is way lighter. Anyway, it is it is the article of clothing that you want out here because you don't want to be slathering on sunscreen every 30 minutes, and uh, the breeze goes right through it, so it's really nice. If you get it wet, it wicks and cools you through the evaporation effect for, I don't know, an hour or more. Um, and really all we have to do is put a little bit of sunscreen on our nose, that's it. Just a little tiny bit on our legs, but our legs are already tanned up and the sun doesn't hit legs so much. But uh, anyway, there she comes. She's got the same one on. We also have matching hats. She's always wanted matching things in our life. We finally came across something that matches really good. So here we are, two peas in a pod. Itchy legs. That's the advantage of nerdy pants, also known as convertible pants. I don't have any on, but... What's interesting is that dome there, that's what we were looking at earlier at lunch. And the shape was incredible. I mean, it's just so like poignant. And now it's kind of broad and dull. But then you get all of these little peaks, all these domes. I don't know the names of them, but it's really cool. And then there's Half Dome, we can see more and more. We can, I think we can see where the cables are that people are climbing up, but uh, we still, it's still too far away for us to see actually individual people. Whoop. And uh, yeah, we're just in these nasty thickets right now. Got another mile of it, so decided it was worth them yeah. delicate legs. <laughs> Should I film you, would it help? Probably. We were just talking about how the wilderness is, it's just full of like so many analogies for uh, truth and reality and God. Like that dome that you're looking at, like it doesn't really look that interesting at all. It's kind of boring, but then when you're about, uh, I don't know, two miles that way, it's breathtaking. And like some things are like that in life. Things that we think are curses from the Lord or bad circumstances. Like they have this beautiful angle. That was Michelle's. And then mine was how like right now you can't, we are literally closer to Half Dome than we've ever been. And yet you can't even see it because of the layout of the terrain and, and the hill and the obstacles and the things blocking your view and the fact that you're looking down at the thorns. But then like you're about to see that like all of a sudden like you're there and in this case we're not literally there but like you know we're, we're closer to it than we've ever been 
And so many things are like that in life, whether it's you're waiting for God to provide a spouse or uh, provide children or heal or some other thing. It's like sometimes these things, they feel so far away or perhaps more accurately described, God feels so far away and he might be actually closer than ever before in some ways. And redemption and your salvation from whatever problem you have may be actually be closer than ever before, but you go through something like this first. And uh, I don't know, it's just, I feel like more than in daily life out here, you those things dawn on you more often. And maybe one other profound thought, at least I think it's profound and it's not my thought, although these are my own words to it, is like out here, everything is God-sized. You know, we are like this tiny speck on the landscape. Uh, this is like, these are God's proportions and dimensions. Like some people build things in millimeters, like engineers. Other people build things in, you know, uh, feet, like bridges. But like God builds things in miles and legions and whatever other term we don't use anymore. But then when you go into a city, everything is human-sized. The doors, the sidewalks, the beds, the tables, the roof line, ev everything revolves around the human. The human becomes the center point for everything. And everything has sort of been built with the human in mind. And it makes you feel like you're in control and you're the center of the universe and all of that. And then you get out here and you're like, wow, I am like this teeny tiny speck on the landscape. And who made all this? And where'd this all come from? And how did I get here? And where am I headed? And I'm on the John Muir Trail. Where is John Muir right now? You know? Is he nowhere? Is he somewhere? Is that somewhere good? Is that somewhere bad? Is that somewhere leading to something? Like, those questions come to you out here and they, I just don't think, I mean, I think about those things a lot in general, but they don't even come to me as often when you're in a human-sized world. But we're not. This is a God-sized world. And his dimensions are not millimeters or inches. They're, well, they're enormous. What do you think about that? I'm the extrovert, you're the introvert. It's real good. It's real good. There's a cool bird right there. Just gonna see what he does as we approach. We're not gonna bother him. We're just gonna walk like we would have if we hadn't spotted. Oh, there's two. Wow. I'm like, I'm like three feet away. Hey bud. I wonder if that's, that's probably not grouse but it's probably in that category. I'm not a hunter. Some hunter tell me what it is. Oh, he just told me his name. Yeah, there's two. I can't, I can't believe how close. Hey, buddy. We're through the nasty stuff. We found a nice little pool to wet our shirts. My legs. This, this, this is the kind of YouTube footage that goes viral. Big rattlesnake. That looks like a, oh yeah, there's the rattle. That thing makes a lot of noise. My wife jumped. He ain't interested in us. Whew. Oh, hey, how's it going? How Good, there's a big rattlesnake here. It looks like he's looking at you. Well, we are out of the burn zone, which was almost three miles. Thank We're back into the beautiful forest, and this area is particularly lush. Uh, just this little babbling brook, as you might call it. Beautiful. And just like that, we're there. That's the back side of Half Dome. The valley's on the other side of it. And, uh, we got about 0.2 miles till we're at the start of the Half Dome Trail. Right now we're still on the John Muir Trail. Oop. Some cool stuff going on over there. Big boulders and spires and domes. It's so bizarre to me. We're about 2.2 miles away from the start of the Half Dome Trail. So this is an area where people like to camp so that in the morning you climb Half Dome and you don't have any extra camping hiking to do. 
this place like a ghost town. Like we have it to ourselves. We saw like four people half a mile ago. But it's just like, I mean, September is not, you know, prime time. It's just into the shoulder season. But it's just like nobody here. We've, we've seen like 15, 20 people in the last four days. It's crazy. I'm just, uh, Mich Michelle and I are not the kind who like really want to be all alone. Like we don't, you know, some people like want that more than anything. It's not really our style, but I'm just amazed. I mean, we don't like it crowded either, but it's just like desolate. That tree, it's gorgeous. Look at that girl, gorgeous. These little squirrels are used to people. He's like four feet away from us. Look how big his cheeks are. Mm. Crammed. Not stunned at all. So it looks like these are sequoia trees, kids. Um, I didn't know they had them in Yosemite outside of Mariposa Grove, but uh, I knocked on the bark and it's soft like sequoia, not cedar. So, so far as I know, there's a couple of sequoias here. It's pretty cool. We are right at the start of the Half Dome trailhead. So basically from this point to the top is two miles exactly. We'll see how long it takes. So we're here kind of at a junction. Uh, the John Muir Trail goes that way and that way. That way is towards Happy Isles and Little uh, Yosemite Valley. And this is the Half Dome. So I assumed that there was going to be a sign here that says no camping beyond this point. Um, and I assumed that because there's always, well, there's almost always prohibited camping near super interesting things like lakes and waterfalls. And Half Dome is one of the most popular things here in the valley, but that sign doesn't exist. And the only sign, uh, basically we looked at our permit again to be sure. And the permit says that you have to be a hundred feet off the trail. And then you have to be one mile away from any high Sierra camps like um, the Fogel saying or Merced. And so, um, and then it says no camping between Glacier Point or Happy Isles and the junction at Sunrise Creek Trail and Half Dome Trail and what's that other one? Oh, the Moraine Dome area. Okay, so this is where Half Dome Trail starts and ends. It starts there and goes up to Half Dome. It doesn't go anywhere else. So this must be the junction, even though this is not Sunrise Creek and the Moraine Dome area is over there. But I don't know where Sunrise Creek Trail is. I saw Sunrise Creek on the map, but I don't see Sunrise Creek Trail anywhere. And so we're a little bit confused. Our intuition tells us that you can't camp up that way because that's what everyone would want to do. And normally that kind of stuff's prohibited. Um, but according to the permit, it's not prohibited because it says no camping on the top of Half Dome and no camping between the Half Dome Trail Junction, which I assume is here, even though it's not, even though the names don't line up, and Happy Isles. So uh, we're going to go up this way, and we're going to get more than 100 feet off trail, and we're going to camp. And I'm making this video in part to show a park ranger in case um, we get in trouble, and and you know we're trying our best to follow the rules, but we're also trying our best to see uh, sunrise from Half Dome, and so we don't want to be parking uh, camping way down that way if we don't have to, um, but also. You know, if you're watching this and you know the answer, leave a comment below. Or if you're the National Park Service, you know, we are trying to follow the rules. We are rule followers. And um, we're doing our best to, but it, it just kind of seems a little bit unclear. So maybe it's totally legit. Um, or maybe we've misunderstood something. And if we have, then we're really sorry. And that wasn't our intention. But we don't want to get up any earlier than we have to, to Summit Half Dome, uh, first thing in the morning for sunrise. So that's my spiel. And I uh, hope it was helpful to someone, maybe to us. We're about a quarter mile up, maybe a bit more, the Half Dome Trail. It's really pretty. There's sequoias and cedar. I'm pretty sure there's sequoias based on the bark. Maybe maybe cedars, maybe I'm wrong. But um, yeah, once again, we just have the place like totally to ourselves. There's like no one around at all. And even like the surrounding area on the John Muir Trail near the junction for Half Dome Trail, there's like no one. Uh, it's so weird because like we had to fight to get the permits and this is like, yeah, it's not the prime season, but it's 
a very, it's like right on the edge of the shoulder season. You'd think it'd still be pretty busy. I'm not sure what day it is. Isn't tomorrow Saturday? You'd think it'd be busy. No, today is Saturday. See, today's Saturday. You'd think it'd be busy all over the place, but it's not. It's just like, just ours. They let you get so close here. It's amazing. Little fawn. Still has its dots. Hi. Hi. Oh. I'm amazed they let you get so close. Like we're in the back country. It's not like Yosemite Valley where they're all used to it. Or maybe they come up from the valley and they are used to it. Where do you guys live? In the valley? Sweet. Never seen this angle of half dome before. I don't know if you can see it, but there's people on the cables. That white strip right there. I can see people. Three people. Um, yeah, I've never seen it from this angle. It's pretty cool. So we're going to summon in the morning and get as close as we can in camp and then get up at like four in the morning to do it. This is not a very common view of Yosemite. The valley is over there and this is the backside. A bunch of domes. It's amazing. I'm going to try and talk Michelle into cowboy camping, right? There in this little well-protected pit. We might find a place for the tent, but it'd be fun to cowboy camp too. The colors are getting beautiful. Sunsets in about 20 minutes. And there she is. And the moon's already out. No wonder this was the first... People will say it's not the first national park, but it was the first piece of land set aside for its beauty, which became a national park. And the only reason Yellowstone is the first is because it went to Wyoming. Or this one went to California, excuse me. And Wyoming, I think, was just a territory. This is effectively the first national park. You can see why. Look at the glow over there. There's Michelle right in the middle. So I guess this is the section where you need a permit. Permit required 24 seven. Keep bags with you at all times. Leave poles at the base of cables. Do not leave gloves, they become trash. Coming down backwards is easier. Huff, save your climbing stories. Have fun, thanks Ranger. Cool. So here is the view from camp. I'm pretty sure that's Basket Dome. And that one there is North Dome. And then the sun set. Half dome to the right, sub dome to the left. You may be able to see people walking right there. And we are like 250 feet off the trail and we're about five minutes from walk from the area where you need um, permit. It seems to me that this place is totally legit for camping, which really surprises me. Normally it seems like they don't want the summit area flooded with campers, but there's no signs that say no camping anywhere. The permit says no camping on top of Half Dome or no camping in between the junction and Happy Isles, and we're in neither of those places. And it's flat and safe and uh, well off the trail. So we're camping with a totally clean conscience and uh, excited about the morning. That is Half Dome there. Well, slightly shrouded by a tree. That's Half Dome. That's the moon. And that's the remnants of the sunset. That's <laughs> just crazy good. Crazy good. That's cool. So on the right, you see the moon. And on the left, you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight headlamps coming down sub dome. That's interesting. <laughs>